Hello, uh, my name is Dan French and I'm a practicing urologist. I'd like to welcome you to the pharmacology chapter covering androgens and antiandrogens. In general, androgens are steroid hormones with anabolic and androgenic properties. They are the primary male sex hormone and importantly they're required for normal male maturation, for normal spermatogenesis or sperm production. And let me say a little bit about spermatogenesis. It not only requires androgens, but it requires very high levels of androgens, namely testosterone. This is why sperm production proceeds in the testicle right next to the tissues that are making testosterone. And you get a very high level of testosterone that facilitates sperm production before that testosterone is diluted out into the bloodstream. Androgens are also required for uh, hemoglobin synthesis. They're required for muscle synthesis. And they also are responsible for the prevention of bone resorption. Recently, there's been a clinical awakening to the diagnosis of low testosterone or hypogonadism. There seems to be an association with metabolic syndrome, such as diabetes and obesity. Whether this is a causal relationship or they just share common risk factors is not yet known. But if you're in clinical practice, you will see more and more men being diagnosed and treated for hypogonadism. On the other side of the coin, we have the antiandrogens, which exert their therapeutic benefit by interrupting androgen synthesis or blocking binding at the receptor level. Uh, antiandrogens are used for clinical conditions such as benign prostatic hypertrophy, prostate cancer, or to treat hirsutism in women. Before we delve into the androgens and their mechanism of action, we should step back and examine the whole hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. This begins in the hypothalamus, which is responsible for a pulsatile release of GnRH, or gonadotropin-releasing hormone. It's important to note that normal gonadotropin-releasing hormone release is in a pulsatile manner. If it's released in a steady state, or you achieve a steady state of GnRH, this will actually downregulate the receptors in the anterior pituitary, and you will get downregulation of the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. The anterior pituitary then responds to GnRH stimulation by releasing gonadotropins. The gonadotropins are luteinizing hormone, or LH, which will stimulate the testicles to produce testosterone and follicle-stimulating hormone, which will stimulate the testicles to undergo spermatogenesis. The testicles, in response to circulating gonadotropins, will produce testosterone in the Leydig cells, which are found in the interstitium. And in response to FSH, spermatogenesis continues along the seminiferous epithelium. Uh, it's uh, important to note that once testosterone is produced in the testicles and released into the bloodstream, that only about 2% of the testosterone uh, is circulating in the free state. The remainder of the testosterone is either bound to sex hormone binding globulin or, to a lesser extent, other proteins such as albumin. Clinically, uh, this manifests uh, in the scenario where you may have a man who is symptomatic of hypogonadism low energy, low sex drive, but his total testosterone level is normal. However, if you were to check his free testosterone, it may be low. This is due to the fact that various clinical conditions may raise or lower the amount of sex hormone binding globulin in an individual, and therefore you get a variable amount of free testosterone. Testosterone circulating in the bloodstream can be further metabolized to uh, other compounds by target tissues. In the adipose tissue, aromatase converts testosterone to estradiol. In the skin, prostate, seminal vesicles, or epididymis, an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase will take testosterone and convert it to 5-alpha dihydrotestosterone, or DHT. This DHT is five times more potent than testosterone itself in these particular tissues. The testicles also produce a substance called inhibin, which is produced as the process of spermatogenesis continues. This inhibin, testosterone, DHT, and estradiol can all have a negative feedback at the level of either the hypothalamus or the pituitary. In such a manner, you get a negative feedback loop, and this is how you maintain 
uh, fairly normal or steady levels of serum testosterone. Separate from the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis uh, are adrenal androgens. The adrenal gland can make androgens in response to ACTH, and these androgens are androstenedione, dihydroepiandrosterone, or DHEA, and dihydroepiandrosterone sulfate, or much easier, DHEAS. Now, the average plasma level of testosterone in a postpubertal male is 0.6 micrograms per deciliter. This is important to note. As a clinical note, most labs report values in nanograms per deciliter, so the average testosterone level would be 600 nanograms per deciliter. Naturally, testosterone levels begin to decline in men after about the age of 50. Testosterone, when circulating, will then be transported through the cell membrane and will bind a receptor in the cytosol. This hormone receptor complex will then enter the nucleus, bind DNA, and stimulate RNA and protein synthesis, exerting its desired effect on the uh, end organ. Testosterone itself is the active ligand in liver and muscle, but as mentioned previously, dihydrotestosterone is the active form in the skin, prostate, epididymis, and seminal vesicles. As mentioned previously, androgens have both androgenic effects, which are masculinizing effects, and anabolic effects, which are tissue building effects. Androgens are used in the treatment of both primary and secondary hypogonadism. Primary hypogonadism implies end organ failure, in this case the testicles, whereas secondary hypogonadism uh, implies testicular failure uh, secondary to a lack of stimulus from the hypothalamus or pituitary gland. When treating uh, patients with hypogonadism, androgens will improve energy, libido, mood, etc. As a more of a historical note, androgens have been used to treat uh, conditions such as osteoporosis. Remember, they prevent bone resorption, but since most patients with osteoporosis are female and androgens can have masculinizing side effects, bisphosphonates have generally replaced androgens in the current treatment of osteoporosis. Also of historical importance is the fact that androgens have been used to treat refractory anemias. More recently, with the development of erythropoietin, this has become the mainstay of treatment for refractory anemias. Androgens are still used to treat wasting in HIV patients and cancer patients, and it's still used to stimulate growth in boys with delayed puberty. Of course, anabolic steroids have been used by athletes to increase lean body mass, strength, and increase endurance. In females, uh, danazole, which is a weak androgen, has been used to treat endometriosis. It does this by inhibiting LH and FSH secretion, but it does not interfere with aromatase, which allows for continued estradiol production, which is obviously important in females. It does still, however, have some masculinizing side effects and therefore is not usually first-line treatment in endometriosis. Various uh, uses of testosterone and combinations of testosterone and other medications have been studied in an effort to develop a male contraceptive medication. Initially, testosterone enanthate, which is an intramuscular formulation, uh, was tested at 400 milligrams per month. They found that less than half of these patients became azospermic, which means no sperm in the semen. They decided that a oral or a contraceptive that uh, was less than 50% effective was not going to do. Therefore, they combined uh, testosterone enanthate at 100 milligrams intramuscularly per week with levonorgestrel, 500 milligrams orally daily, and discovered that 94% of patients uh, became azospermic. These data, however, are preliminary, and this is not yet in clinical use. Another compound studied uh, is gossipol. This is a cottonseed derivative that destroys the seminiferous epithelium. In the majority of patients, it did reduce the sperm count to 4 million or less, normal being 20 million per milliliter. Uh, however, uh, it did not often take the sperm count down to azospermic levels, which is what you would desire.
and it did have a significant toxicity, mainly related to hypokalemia. Given the marginal efficacy and significant toxicity, this compound is not being used. As of yet, it's important to note that there are no oral male contraceptive medications available. When treating somebody with androgens, it's important to keep in mind they also have adverse effects. In females, androgens will cause masculinization. This can occur at doses of 200 to 300 milligrams per month. These masculinizing effects include undesired things such as acne, facial hair, deepening of the voice, baldness, masculinity, clitoral enlargement, and menstrual irregularity. Androgens are absolutely contraindicated in pregnant women. Not only will you get uh, masculinization of the mother, but you will get virilization of a female fetus, and this can cause uh, developmental uh, problems lifelong. Uh, so pregnancy is an absolute contraindication to testosterone or any androgen use in women. In males, uh, I'd like to emphasize that uh, the use of androgens can cause decreased spermatogenesis and even result in azospermia. Uh, I uh, specialize in male infertility and often see men with a low sperm count or no sperm who've been placed on testosterone for one reason or another. If testosterone is necessary for spermatogenesis, why does treating somebody with testosterone uh, impair sperm production? Well, for two reasons. First, the exogenous androgen results in negative feedback on the hypothalamus and pituitary, so you get a decreased release of gonadotropins and a decreased signal to the testicles to produce testosterone. But you also get a decrease in testicular testosterone production because of that negative feedback. And remember, Spermatogenesis requires very high levels of testosterone seen only in the testicle to proceed in a normal fashion. So it's important if you're going to put a man on uh, androgens, you should first address with him uh, his desire to potentially father children. Other adverse effects include gynecomastia, prostate growth that can exacerbate the symptoms of BPH, such as nocturia or weak urinary stream. It can cause testicular atrophy, more often seen at high doses. Again, this has to do with the fact that you will have external androgens that suppress testicular androgen production. And since the majority of the testicular volume comes from the Leydig cells where testosterone is made, if they become senescent, you will get a reduction in the testicular volume. It can also cause acne and baldness in men. And in men, it is contraindicated uh, in patients who have known prostate cancer or male breast cancer. We do not think that testosterone causes prostate cancer, but we do know that it can fuel the cancer growth. And therefore, uh, when treating men with uh, uh, testosterone, it's important to know their PSA level and be aware of this. Uh, in children, uh, androgens can cause precocious puberty. So when treating a uh, boy with hypopituitarism, you want to wait until they're about the pubertal age before you add in androgens because they will uh, have those masculinizing effects. It's also important to note that androgens will cause premature closure of the epiphyseal plate. And therefore, when you start androgens in boys with hypopituitarism at the right time, you want to start them at low doses and slowly work up, thereby preventing uh, premature closure of the epiphyseal plate and short stature. By doing this, you mimic kind of the natural progression of hormone production in puberty. In general, androgens can adversely affect the LDL to HDL ratio. They will increase serum LDL levels and decrease serum HDL levels, which is the opposite of what you would like. They can also cause exacerbation of sleep apnea or of CHF and edema. These aren't absolute contraindications, but in patients with these comorbidities, you should warn them that testosterone or androgen therapy may make those situations worse. As noted earlier, androgens also stimulate hemoglobin production, and therefore in patients on androgens, you have to be careful that they don't develop erythrocytosis. This is mostly seen at high doses, but as a rule, I generally check a CBC and a PSA after patients have been on androgen therapy for th after three months. 
Now let's pause for a moment and review the material that was just covered. Before we do that, if you haven't already done so, this might be a good time to read your pharmacology text that corresponds to the material that was just discussed. Then together, we'll go through the quick review in the study guide. His ears are so acute, he can hear grade zero heart murmurs. He has no need to wash his hands because bacteria fear him. His admission orders simply say, stay out of my way. He is the most exceptional doctor in the world. Gentlemen, I wouldn't start comparing your level of androgens to my own. It's hard for a man to feel that inadequate. So be content with your masculinity. Not every man can be exceptional. Speaking of which, when are androgens contraindicated in males? Well done, males with prostate or breast cancer. Now excuse me, I have some manly thoughts to consider. Study well, my friends. Hi, I'm Dr. Chris Lewis, one of the chief educators here at Doctors in Training. It's time for your quick review number one. Let's get started. Explain the regulation of secretion of testosterone. So let's start at the top and work our way down. So first, gonadotropin releasing hormone, or GNRH, is secreted from the hypothalamus. Now this stimulates the release of LH from the anterior pituitary, and then this leads to release of testosterone from the Leydig cells. Next question. Testosterone exerts its effects directly in muscle and liver tissue. Testosterone must be metabolized into what hormone to exert its effect in other tissue? So which hormone does more of the dirty work of testosterone than tes testosterone itself? Well, that's going to be the dihydrotestosterone, or DHT. Next question. Why have bisphosphonates replaced androgens for the treatment of osteoporosis? So remember when we talked about uh, previous historical uses of uh, testosterone, and one of it was that it helps preserve uh, bone breakdown. Well, we don't do that anymore. We have these bisphosphonates, which, which work really great. They decrease osteoclast activity. And the reason why we don't like using the androgens anymore is because they cause masculinization of women. So the last thing women want is to improve their bone density, but then give them a lot of body hair and other uh, male-like qualities. So that's why the bisphosphonates are far and away the most popular medication for this problem. Next question. In order to have normal function, synthesis, and release of gonadotropins, how should gonadotropin-releasing hormone, or GNRH, be secreted by the hypothalamus? So normally, our body is releasing this GNRH from the hypothalamus in a pulsatile fashion, and that's the answer. And this pulsatile fashion will stimulate the release of gonadotropins, and that's how we get our normal uh, patterns of life. Now, a lot of the medications that we use, we use in a continuous fashion. And, and when you use GNRH or one of the GNRH agonists, um, you get suppression of your gonadotropin release. So remember, pulsatile for normal, uh, continuous for suppression. Next question. What is the effect of LH on females and males? So we've been talking about our gonadotropins. We should probably know a little bit more about the LH and the FSH. Pretty easy stuff. So in females, LH will trigger ovulation and uh, development of the corpus luteum. So this is more if uh, women are becoming pregnant. You have to maintain that corpus luteum. And then in males, we stimulate production of testosterone. That's very pertinent to our lecture so far today. Next question, what is the effect of FSH on females and males? Sometimes we mistakenly think of FSH as just a female hormone. So in females, it does initiate follicular growth, but in males, it's still very, very important because it helps stimulate spermatogenesis. So don't get caught up in thinking that when we're talking about androgens, we're just talking about LH, we're actually talking about FSH as well in males because you have to have spermatogenesis. Next question. What is the effect of androgens on cholesterol? So this is very, very important because when we're replacing uh, testosterone in some of our men with hypogonadism, you still want to really check their cholesterol and make sure you're not doing a lot of harm because uh, you get some negative effects. You lower your HDL, and your HDL is your high-density lipoprotein, and that is your good cholesterol. So you want to have that one high, so this gives us the negative effect. It lowers it. And then it increases your LDL, or your low-density lipoprotein. So, be sure to check your cholesterol before and after starting any androgen therapy on patients. Next question. When women take 200 to 300 milligrams of testosterone per month, what are the major effects? So most of the time this is uh, masculinization problems. You're going to have 
hirsutism, excessive body hair, acne, amenorrhea, clitoral enlargement, deepening of the voice, and male pattern baldness. Next question. Where are androstenedione and DHEA and DHEAS produced? Um, so the wrong uh, answer is in the testes. Uh, you know, when we think of just regular testosterone, we think of those Leydig cells, we think of the testes. But when we think of these other, sometimes more important hormones um, in certain situations, we need to think of the adrenal gland. So largely uh, produced in the adrenal gland rather than the testes. All right, that's going to conclude our quick review number one. Let's get back to the lecture. Let's talk about some of the specific androgens and their uses now. First off is testosterone. Unfortunately, it's orally deactivated by first pass metabolism and therefore not effective in the oral form. It is available in transdermal gels or patches or buccal lozenges and in these forms is administered once daily. The C17 esters of testosterone are administered intramuscularly. The esterification makes them more lipid soluble, allowing for every two week dosing. These C17 esters include testosterone enanthate and testosterone cypionate. As a matter of clinical re relevance, it matters when you check testosterone levels to monitor treatment. Patients on IM testosterone experience a high peak in testosterone level within the first few days after treatment and by about five days after their uh, dose, they've returned into the therapeutic range. And therefore, I check a testosterone level about five days after an intramuscular dose. In patients on testosterone gels or other topical transdermal therapies, it takes a little while for the medication to absorb through the skin. Therefore, within the first few hours after administration, they will still have low testosterone levels. They become uh, therapeutic or peak somewhere around five to six hours after uh, administration of the uh, dose. Therefore, if a man takes his shower in the morning, applies his testosterone gel, and goes by the lab on his way to work, you'll get a value that's probably lower than therapeutic because the level has been checked too soon after administration of the dose. It's best to have them check a level six to 12 hours after they apply the medication. These 17 alpha alkylated testosterone derivatives, though associated with a risk of hepatotoxicity, are available in oral form. The alkylation allows for oral administration. Fluoxymesterone is one such uh, derivative. Oxandrolone is another uh, alkylated testosterone derivative. It has minimal hepatotoxicity and therefore has been used to treat weight loss in HIV patients. It's also used to prevent protein breakdown in patients on chronic uh, corticosteroids. It's been shown to improve uh, recovery from severe burns in more recent research, but it does have abuse potential. Let's shift gears now to the antiandrogens and discuss their therapeutic benefits. Uh, therapy for metastatic prostate cancer is one area where uh, androgen uh, blockade or uh, reduction in androgen levels has uh, long been a mainstay of treatment. Before discussing the antiandrogens themselves, let's talk about the GnRH agonists. They are medications such as luprolide or gocerolin, and though technically not an antiandrogen, they do serve to reduce testosterone to castrate levels. Again, though they're agonists of GnRH, they are administered as depo injections that last one month to one year, thus creating a steady state of GnRH and again downregulating the pituitary receptors and downregulating the HPG axis, resulting in cessation of testosterone production by the testicles. It's important to note, however, when starting uh, androgen deprivation with a GnRH analog, at the first dose, you will get a flare in response because you haven't developed that steady state. There will be a flare in testosterone production. And somebody with metastatic disease will get a uh, flare in their prostate cancer growth. For somebody with spinal cord metastases who may have impending cord compression, this could kind of put them over the edge. Therefore, antiandrogens have been used to block uh, androgen receptors and prevent the tumor response to this flare in serum testosterone levels. 
Uh, one such uh, antiandrogen is flutamide, which is an oral, non-steroidal, competitive antagonist at the androgen receptor. Again, it's used at the initiation of GnRH therapy to prevent an exacerbation of the cancer by the initial testosterone flare. Uh, it can also be used in combination with the uh, GnRH, GnRH agonist long term for complete androgen blockade. This is helpful when patients have been maintained on a GnRH agonist alone and their PSA begins to rise. Since the cancer is now growing at very low levels of testosterone, adding in flutamide to block the androgen receptors can exhibit both a clinical and a PSA response. Side effects of flutamide include gynecomastia, uh, mild liver toxicity, and GI upset, but the side effects are generally better tolerated than that of a GnRH agonist, which can cause uh, decreased libido, uh, erectile dysfunction, and hot flashes. So sometimes flutamide has been used as monotherapy for metastatic prostate cancer, though it is less effective than a GnRH agonist. Uh, Bicalutamide and nilutamide are newer uh, oral androgen receptor blockers. They have the same indications as flutamide, but with a better side effect profile. Benign prostatic hypertrophy, or BPH, is another area where antiandrogens exhibit a therapeutic effect. The antiandrogens used for BPH therapy are finasteride and dutasteride. These uh, medications are 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. They prevent the conversion of testosterone to the more active form of dihydrotestosterone in the prostate tissue. Over time, this can result in a 30% decrease in prostate size. But monotherapy with either finasteride or dutasteride takes three to six months to see uh, symptomatic improvement. Therefore, uh, the 5 alpha reductase inhibitors are often used in combination therapy with an alpha blocker. If you haven't studied the alpha blockers yet, you will, and they are medications that cause relaxation of the prostate smooth muscle, thereby decreasing the impingement on the urethra. The alpha blockers will result in very uh, rapid symptomatic improvement. We know that when combined uh, together, a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor and an alpha blocker can exhibit improvement in BPH symptoms to a much greater degree than either treatment alone. The prostate cancer prevention trial uh, is a famous uh, study that has shown that finasteride is capable of preventing prostate cancer versus placebo. Initially, it was thought that the reduction in prostate cancer came at the risk of uh, developing a higher grade of cancer if you were to develop cancer while on finasteride. Subsequently, this has been shown to be just a uh, uh, bias due to the decrease in size of the prostate and better diagnostic accuracy of a biopsy in these patients. However, it's still yet to be determined exactly which patients would benefit from prostate cancer prevention using a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. These medications uh, do have sexual side effects, including uh, erectile dysfunction, ejaculatory dysfunction, and a decrease in libido. These happen in, generally in less than 10% of the patients, but is probably the most common complaint of patients on these medications. Finasteride is used to treat BPH at a 5 milligram daily dose, but can also be used to treat male pattern baldness at a one milligram daily dose. Finally, it should be noted that the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors can decrease your PSA level by about 40 to 50 percent. Therefore, if you're following the PSA on a patient who is on a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, it's important to double that PSA level before making any clinical judgments. Uh, other important antiandrogens uh, include ketoconazole, Ketoconazole is probably better known as an antifungal, uh, but at high doses, it inhibits the P450 aromatase-dependent steroidogenesis, and thereby will inhibit testosterone production. It's used to treat hirsutism in women and precocious puberty in boys. It can also be used for rapid reduction in t of testosterone levels, which is helpful in patients who may have cord compression from metastatic prostate cancer. 
The symptoms of cord compression would be uh, lower extremity pain or paresthesias, bowel or bladder incontinence, or urinary retention. This is an actual emergency, and either surgical castration or ketoconazole is used to rapidly decrease testosterone levels in addition to either radiotherapy or surgery to the uh, offending side of metastasis. If not treated within hours, uh, the effects of spinal cord compression can become permanent. Spironolactone is another antiandrogen, which is maybe better known as a diuretic. It's a potassium sparing diuretic that uh, binds the aldosterone receptor and uh, competitively inhibits aldosterone binding. It also blocks the androgen receptor and can be used to treat hirsutism in women. Saproterone is uh, a drug with orphan drug status in the United States, but it inhibits androgen action again at the target organ. It is also used to treat hirsutism in women, but more interestingly, has been used to decrease sexual desire in men. Now let's pause for a moment and review the material that was just covered. Before we do that, if you haven't already done so, this might be a good time to read your pharmacology text that corresponds to the material that was just discussed. Then together, we'll go through the quick review in the study guide. Why, hello there! I have a quick question for you. Do you remember which of the drugs used for androgenic alopecia is contraindicated in premenopausal women? Why, it's finasteride, of course, also known as Propecia. And do you know why finasteride is contraindicated? Finasteride is teratogenic. It inhibits 5-alpha reductase, so it inhibits the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. So, a male fetus could develop feminization or other problems with his external genitalia, including hypospadias. Therefore, finasteride is pregnancy category X, and even the handling of crushed or broken pills by a pregnant woman can lead to birth defects. Men who take finasteride can't even donate blood for at least a month after their last dose. Lucky for me, I found a non-pharmacological therapy for my male pattern baldness. Not bad, huh? I got it from the same place as the Donald, Discount Wig Emporium. My girlfriend Sylvia says she can't even tell it isn't my real hair. Of course, she's mostly blind and a little senile. But then again, so am I. <laughs> All right, and we're back. It's time for our quick review number two. Let's get started. A 69-year-old male presents to the clinic with a prostate mass and an urge to urinate. He has started on Luprolide. He returns after four days with a worsening urge to urinate. What is the cause of his symptoms? So what does he probably have? You know, he probably has some form of prostate cancer. We're really not going into the details of the treatment of that cancer or whatever's going on. But we know he's on Luprolide, uh, and we know that he had an urge to urinate. Now he has a worsening urge to urinate. So what's going on here? Well, the GnRH agonists, when given continuously, will suppress gonadal function. So we talked about this in our last quick review. However, in the first few days of starting the medication, there is a transient increase in androgens. So in the very beginning, the GnRH agonists are stimulating the anterior pituitary. So it's going to be uh, shooting out more gonadotropins uh, at, at the end of this process. So that's why we're having a worsening of the symptoms early on. Now, subsequent to this, there's going to be a suppression of overall activity and uh, hopefully uh, symptoms will improve. Next question. What are the side effects of the GnRH agonists? So uh, you need to know if you're giving these medications, what else is going to happen? Well, it's going to be very similar to um, a lot of our other problems with uh, decreasing our gonadotropin function in general. So decreased libido, erectile dysfunction, and hot flashes. Next question. What are the symptoms of benign prostatic hypertrophy? So we've talked about drugs to treat this. Um, how are you going to diagnose it? So it's a very, very common problem, probably underdiagnosed because men don't like to talk about their urinary habits, but something you need to get into the habit of asking your patients, especially when they're getting over the age of 50. Um, everyone's going to have an enlarged prostate to some extent. Not everyone's going to have symptoms, but you need to ask the questions. So first, urinary symptoms. And there's a lot of urinary plus a descriptor. So you're going to have urinary hesitancy, urinary urgency. So people are going to feel like they have to go very quickly um, they can't wait, they got to run to the bathroom. And then when they get there, they have that hesitancy, so they're just kind of waiting and waiting and waiting to initiate that stream. 
frequency, so they're going more often. Actual incontinence, so they don't actually get to the bathroom in time. Intermittency, so they start a stream and then their stream will stop and their stream will start and stop, so that's kind of annoying as well. And then ultimately, if it's really bad, you can get retention where you can't urinate at all. Now, sometimes you can have a straining to void problem. So you ask the patient, well, when you start, do you feel like you really have to increase your abdominal pressure in order to get it out? And then the last one is dribbling. So having this, you know, when they stop and start their stream, there's just sort of this very slow to initiate stream. And then it's just like they're dribbling for, for several seconds afterwards as well. So ask all those great questions. You will uh, get more positives than negatives, and you'll be very surprised. Next question. A 55-year-old male presents with symptoms of benign prostatic hypertrophy. He has a moderately enlarged prostate. He has a normal PSA level, or the prostate-specific antigen, level at 3.0 nanograms uh, per deciliter. The patient is started on dutasteride. His symptoms improve and he returns in one year and his PSA is still 3.0. What is worrisome in this scenario? So, um, you can come up with lots of scenarios where you give a patient a medication and they get lost to follow up. Maybe they don't have the test they need to get done, but this can happen. I mean, it'll happen hopefully not very often. But so when we're taking these 5 alpha reductase inhibitors, so dutasteride, what do we expect in the PSA? Well, we expect the PSA to drop. Remember how we described in the lecture here that um, when someone's on these medications, you basically have to double the PSA level uh, to determine sort of what it really should be. So in this case, he started at three, and now he's still at three despite being on the medication. So he's had a significant increase, per se, uh, in his PSA, even though the number's the same. So the answer to the question here, five alpha reductase inhibitors decrease the PSA by half, and this patient needs to be further evaluated for prostate cancer. So um, he may not have prostate cancer, but at this point, he hasn't had his decrease in uh, PSA. His actual PSA is 6, which is above normal. Again, doesn't absolutely mean he has to have prostate cancer, but he needs a further workup. Next question. A 68-year-old male with congestive heart failure presents with gynecomastia and erectile dysfunction. What medication might this patient be taking for his CHF that can cause these side effects? So this uh, is a very common medication that we talked about, spironolactone. So it's our uh, potassium sparing diuretic. It is not first line medication for CHF, but it's a very common medication that we use in CHF. And it does have this anti-androgen effect. So men can get gynecomastia, they can get erectile dysfunction. So be aware of that. Next question. What is the more common clinical use of ketoconazole what does it, uh, how does it work as an anti-androgen? So it's more often used as an antifungal, um, so be aware of that. Um, and then at high doses, it inhibits the cytochrome P450 aromatase dependent steroidogenesis. So you're actually decreasing uh, your steroid production, but also it acts as an androgen receptor antagonist as well. So it competes with androgens for the androgen receptor. So be aware that those two things are happening uh, with ketoconazole. Next question. A 55-year-old male presents with typical BPH symptoms, which we talked about in our uh, quick reviews. His PSA is normal, and his exam reveals a mildly enlarged prostate. Which class of medication is usually considered first line for this type of patient? So um, another thing you should know about BPH is that feeling a prostate is sometimes a little bit subjective. We're, we're estimating how big that prostate is. And then also know that there are some patients who are very, very sensitive to just mildly enlarged prostates, and there are some people who can have gigantic prostates and not have any symptoms at all. So be aware that feeling that prostate isn't always going to be an indication of how bad symptoms are going to be. So in this scenario, he has typical symptoms. He has normal PSA. His prostate doesn't seem that huge. What are you going to use? Well, you probably can get into a, a debate on... Um, there being more than one answer to this question. But most of the time, people are going to grab for alpha blockers. So alpha blockers, at least historically, have been first line for any BPH symptoms. And I would say in this situation, it makes sense because he only has a mildly enlarged prostate. If he had a very large prostate and he had very serious or um, um, severe symptoms, then you could consider using one of the five alpha reductase inhibitors or more than likely a combination. So. Um, I would, in this patient, probably just use an alpha blocker to start with, see how he does, see if his symptoms improve, uh, continue to give him exams, make sure we're not having an enlargement in the prostate, check in his PSAs. And then subsequently, he might need one of the 5 alpha reductase inhibitors. Um, but it's not absolutely wrong to start this patient on, on a 5 alpha uh, reductase inhibitor either.
All right, so that's going to conclude our quick review number two. It's not going to be time for our end of session quiz. So I want you to turn off the video. I want you to answer all the questions in the end of session quiz as best you can. And then I want you to turn on the video again and we'll go over the answers together. All right, we're back. And now it's time for our end of session quiz. Let's go over these answers. Match the following medications with their characteristics. So first we have uh, dutasteride. Pretty easy, this is a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. Spironolactone, this is a potassium sparing diuretic with anti-androgenic effects. Gocelerin is a GnRH agonist. And oxandrolone is a 17-alpha alkylated testosterone derivative. Next, what hormone from the anterior pituitary is most responsible for testosterone synthesis? So remember, well, let's back up. What actually affects the uh, anterior pituitary first? GnRH, so our gonadotropin releasing hormone. It's coming in a pulsatile fashion. And then from the anterior pituitary, what's being released? Luteinizing hormone. So very, very important. That helps in the synthesis. But for spermatogenesis, you're still going to have FSH secreted from uh, the anterior pituitary as well. Next question. Which of the following medications would be most appropriate for uh, the clinical scenarios? So we have our four different drugs here. Let's go through the scenarios. A 28-year-old female with hirsutism. Well, we're going to use spironolactone. A 59-year-old male with BPH already on an alpha blocker. We're going to add on finasteride, one of our 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. A 41-year-old HIV patient with weight loss. Well, you can use um, oxandrolone for this one. 72-year-old male with metastatic prostate cancer, we're going to use Luprolide. And then a 32-year-old male who wants treatment for male pattern baldness, finasteride. Next question. What androgen would you use to help treat endometriosis? Well, this is going to be danazole. Remember, this has very weak anti-androgen effects. You're not going to get a lot of the other negative side effects of it, but can be useful in decreasing the pain of endometriosis. Next question. List the medications that bind at the androgen receptor to exert an anti-androgen effect. So there's quite a few here um, that we talked about. So we have bicaltumide, we have nilutamide, ketoconazole, flutamide, spironolactone, and saproterone. Next question. How can giving testosterone to a boy with pubertal delay cause stunted growth? So uh, this can be a really tricky situation. You have uh, Boys who are having some pubertal delay, it can be very embarrassing for them. They're probably of a little bit short stature. So there's going to be a very strong push from parents and from the patient themselves, like, make me normal, make me normal. But you have to be very, very careful because you don't want to do more harm than good. If you give too much testosterone too quickly, then you can run the risk of prematurely closing uh, the, the epiphyseal plate. So if you do that, then you're going to make them short the rest of their life. So if you do choose to do this, and you probably need to uh, let this go to your endocrinologist as best you can uh, for these very tricky calculations on, on how you're going to give the testosterone and how much and how quickly and that sort of thing, because you don't want to make them uh, permanently short uh, just because they're a little delayed in their puberty by giving them too much testosterone too quickly. Next question. What are the contraindications for androgen therapy? Very important um, because you're going to have a lot of people, especially male, uh, who will come to you saying, I need um, testosterone because they don't feel as young, they don't feel as virile, and there's a lot of things on the internet, a lot of things on TV that are equating testosterone with this fountain of youth phenomenon where, like, I feel 30 years younger and I feel great and I want to have sex and onward and onward and onward. So you're going to be pressured to give people testosterone. Um, but when do you not want to use it? Well, in females, obviously pregnancy, and that's an easy one. And there's not too many pregnant women who want testosterone therapy, so that's not a big deal. Um, but you need to make sure they're not pregnant. People with breast cancer, um, this includes both men and female, but though females are going to more often have breast cancer, obviously. And then the big one that you can really get burned on is prostate cancer. So you're going to have a man come up to you who said, I need testosterone because I don't feel good. You 
have to make sure they don't have prostate cancer because what's the problem with prostate cancer is it's a very slow growing tumor and a lot of people don't have symptoms for a long, long time. Now, if you have this uh, subclinical prostate cancer going on and then you fill this person up for testosterone for several years, then you're doing them a lot of harm. So be very, very careful. You don't want to just write a, um, a prescription for the testosterone gel just because someone's feeling uh, not as virile as they did before. You really need to take the time Screen them appropriately, make sure you're doing your PSAs and your full exams and all this stuff before uh, you try to make people happy. Next question. Name the five alpha reductase inhibitors and what hormone do they ultimately decrease? So I uh, need to know this, there's just two of them right now, finasteride and dutasteride, and then they're going after the five alpha dihydrotestosterone. So uh, they're decreasing that DHT, uh, which is a very potent form of testosterone or uh, metabolite of testosterone. Next question, what is the most common use for spironolactone? So we talked about this before. This is a potassium sparing diuretic. We often use it in CHF, though, again, it's not your first diuretic you're going to grab for. Most people are going to be on thiazide and loop diuretics before they get to the potassium sparing diuretic, uh, unless they're having some low uh, potassium levels. And be aware uh, of their side effects. Remember the gynecomastia. Remember, remember the decreased libido. Remember the erectile dysfunction. Next question, what are the effects of testosterone on the body? So we've been talking a lot about testosterone. Let's go over one more time. What's its natural uh, uses? So normal maturation of males. So if you don't have testosterone, you're not going to go through puberty. You're not going to have your normal maturation process. Sperm production. Remember, uh, you have to have a lot of testosterone in the seminiferous tubules in order to have that sperm production. Increased synthesis of muscle proteins in hemoglobin. So if you want to have muscle mass, you have to have testosterone. That's one of the reasons it can be abused because it does put a lot of lean muscle on people. And then decreased bone res uh, resorption. Important there, but we don't give testosterone or antigens in order to prevent that bone loss. What are we using instead? We're using bisphosphonates and calcium, and there's some other things we use as well, but we're not using testosterone to maintain uh, bone density. All right, so that's going to conclude our end of session quiz. That's going to end our lecture for today. I hope you learned something and good luck studying.